uh, to kind of review the, uh, as Kevin said, I was going to review the agenda for you in this hour. Um, so basically, I'm going to give you an overview of the project, and then uh, Sam Kim, who is our uh, project engineer for our integrated test and evaluation um, uh, portion of the project at the local aspects here at Armstrong, uh, will talk to you about the current test activity that we have uh, ongoing, our current flight test activity. And then uh, he and uh, Deborah Randall and I, so Deborah Randall will join us. She's our chief systems engineer. I can tell from earlier today you guys have a lot of technical questions. So Deborah, she's your target. Um, <laughs> so Deborah will join us and we'll do a, a Q&A panel session uh, for you. So we'll kind of hold off on all questions, I think, till we get to, to that point. And that maybe that'll make things a little bit flow a little bit easier for us. Okay? All right, so with that, I will advance. So just to kind of give you guys a little bit more orientation, and maybe you already have it, so I'll kind of go through it a little quickly. Um, where, where does our project fit within the agency? So our work is all in the Aeronautics Research uh, Mission Directorate, or ARMD, if I slip up later and call it that, that's what it stands for. Um, and the work on this project occurs at all four of our aeronautics um, uh, centers. So those would be um, NASA Langley uh, Research Center over in Hampton, Virginia, uh, Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California, and then of course here at Armstrong Flight Research Center. So work on this project happens at all four of those centers. And then um, ARMD is organized now into four uh, distinct programs. Uh, and, uh, and then they also have um, in our strategic implementation plan a, um, a series of strategic thrusts. And so across those four programs and those uh, six thrusts, basically it defines all of the work that's happening in ARMD. Um, our project exists within the Integrated Aviation uh, Systems Program, which is the pink one there on the end. And so the projects in that program all are flight research oriented. Uh, they do um, research and technology developments, and they um, assure those de developments through um, integrated system level tests. So, uh, so basically, that's the kind of work we're doing on the project, to give you a little foreshadowing of that. And, um, and where our project kind of falls within um, our ARMD strategic plan, uh, like I said, there are these six strategic thrusts. Our work is all in thrust six which is Assured Autonomy for Aviation Transformation. Um, each one of the thrusts have kind of a near-term, mid-term, and far-term um, outcome. And so our work all falls into the near-term outcome, which is dealing with integration for UAS and the NAPS. So um, our project goal is uh, ultimately to provide uh, research findings uh, that would allow uh, the reduction of technical barriers um, against you know, integrating UAS into the NAS. So you know, our goal was ultimately, um, as, a, as, a, um, as a world, <laughs> uh, or as a country, anyway, is to integrate, give routine access for UAS into the national airspace system. To get there, um, there's a few barriers towards that, and so the research that we do um, is helping to reduce those barriers, and then um, we, we gather those research findings, again, using those um, integrated system level tests in a relevant environment. Uh, so then ARB uses uh, uh, two terms, research themes and technical challenges, to address the ways in which we accomplish that goal. So uh, for us, we have uh, two research themes. Uh, one deals with the development of airspace integration procedures and performance standards. And then the second research theme deals with the development of a test infrastructure that would allow you to validate those performance um, standards and procedures. And so then we have four technical challenges. And so these technical challenges are each focusing on an aspect of um, or of a, of a barrier towards UAS integration. So uh, sense and avoid, um, command and control, and human systems integration, they all pertain to that first research theme and the development uh, towards um, uh, procedures and performance standards. And then our fourth technical challenge, of which um, Sam is the, the technical lead for, is the integrated test and evaluation uh, technical challenge. And so in addition to developing a test infrastructure, a live virtual constructive um, strewed environment, which we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, that allows us to kind of do all of do our research and the these system integrated uh, system level integrated tests. Um, they also conduct these tests, uh, meeting the requirements for the other three technical challenges. So that's a lot to say about our project very quickly. <laughs> um, but to say it a different way, um, we have this um, high level concept operational uh, view of the project. So. Um, 
basically from what I described, you get that feel for IT and E kind of being the backbone of our integrated testing. Um, but looking at each one of our technical challenges and how they interrelate together, um, you can see from sensing a void or, or detecting a void, another way to say the same thing, um, what we're really trying to address there is right now uh, there is a, a regulation for a pilot in the cockpit to remain well clear of other aircraft. So uh, the way in which to do that is to see and avoid those, uh, those aircraft that they may encounter. So um, not being in the cockpit now, how does the pilot see and avoid? Um, so it's we come along with another, another approach, um, sense to avoid or detecting the void, that makes use of, um, of sensors uh, to do that sensing part, um, and then relaying information down to the pilot on the ground in the ground control station so that the pilot can take proper steps to avoid other aircraft. So um, we kind of have two categories of aircraft as we call them, cooperative, non-cooperative. Uh, basically the cooperative aircraft are those that we say have sophisticated sensors on board like um, automatic dependent surveillance, broadcast, ADSB, or um, traffic collision avoidance um, systems, so that's uh, like TCAS. By having those sophisticated on sensors on board, it would allow um, our Akana aircraft, which is one of the aircraft you're going to go see later on today, um, to be able to then uh, detect the, those, uh, those cooperative aircraft uh, from further distances. But for the non-cooperative, as we call them, those that don't have those sophisticated sensors on board, uh, like TSA general aviation aircraft, then you need to use um, another sensor, so like an onboard radar that would allow you to still detect them. So in order to fly in the national airspace system, we would need to be able to detect all possible intruders that, um, that we can encounter. And, um, and so that's kind of the technology source saving questions to the end. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a mechanism for us to do that. Um, uh, the other technical challenge I mentioned was command and control. And so that one allows us to uh, be able to, so the command and control um, actual um, area allows the pilot to fly the aircraft. Um, and uh, uh, what we've done on this project is we've uh, designed a prototype um, control non-payload communication system which basically focuses on a, a radio and uh, supporting infrastructure to allow um, a plane flying along with that radio installed to kind of move from one tower to another ground tower, doing handoffs and things like that. This is a terrestrial-based system, so not it's different from like a satellite communications-based system. Um, and so, uh, so through the development of this, we do flight research to go ahead and expand on our awareness and, and knowledge of that uh, of that system. And, um, and again, there's a data link associated with it that then allows the pilot to um, send commands to control the aircraft uh, up to the airplane, as well as sending information like, say, that sensor information um, mm -hmm. down to the uh, pilot in the ground control station. Our human systems integration technical challenge then is that human factors component of the other two. So um, it really allows uh, for the design, what we're doing is uh, design of displays for ground control systems that would allow the pilot then to take advantage of the information from the algorithms that we've developed in the sense of avoid, detect and avoid area, um, as well as uh, the information you know, that comes down on the data link. Through those, the pilot can also control the aircraft. And so um, really the, it's where the, the ground control station displays is kind of where everything comes together. Um, we also do, um, and so then uh, with IT&E, I should say, uh, like I said, IT&E is kind of the backbone of our integration testing. So this environment that's uh, kind of in the background, so we're flying, um, we do most of our, um, a lot of our flight tests here, uh, in, uh, and, and Sam will kind of talk about the airspace around here. Um, but uh, using that live, virtual, constructed, distributed environment that I mentioned, it allows us to replicate airspace in other places, it allows us to have live aircraft and uh, as we would call them, virtual aircraft, so um, uh, to interact in the same environment so that the pilot can then really experience lots of intruders, let's say, but we're operating in a, in a safe, uh, safe, in, in safe environment when we're doing our testing. In addition to those four technical challenge areas that I talked about, there's two other areas that we work on in this project. They're not part of our core um, technical challenge work, but they are things that we think are important with respect to UAS integration. and. Um, and so we, uh, we do some efforts there. Um, so we have a restricted um, use certification uh, effort uh, where we are looking at a precision agriculture mission um, and seeing what it would take to gather the safety substantiation data to develop a, a 
mock type certification basis for an aircraft with that mission. And then also looking at how we can expand that information. So right now, what current rules and regulations would apply to a UAS and use those towards uh, developing that certification. But then, um, again, I, we did it around a precision agriculture mission, but you could also look at it, um, at its applicability across other missions. So we kind of look at that. And then uh, we also did some work with small UAS um, um, doing mission support technology. So an example um, that's kind of shown here is uh, looking at sensor technologies that would help with fire detection, right? So uh, identifying the smoke plume or the intensity of the fire. Um, so those are kind of those uh, other areas that we look at as well. So that's the one graphical interpretation of our entire project. Um, and so that's kind of, that summarizes kind of the work that we're doing. So this project uh, it started in uh, May of 2011. Um, it was originally envisioned to end at the end of this fiscal year. Um, so uh, we've been marching along with uh, doing some, uh, in the beginning, initial modeling and simulation and flight testing and then um, in the second phase of the project that started FY14, shifting gears to doing more integrated testing and um, both on the modeling, simulation and flight testing uh, arenas. Um, but uh, all of our work that we've chosen, so like I mentioned, we're doing those four technical challenge areas, for example, all of that's really driven by what the UAS community um, is, uh, is needing where the, uh, the technical barriers are and, and, and work that we can do to accomplish and reduce those. Um, we've recently been approved to continue um, for an uh, additional four years, so FY17 through FY20. So we'll continue to do the research um, that we've been doing, um, closing down kind of the stuff that, uh, that we've been working on and then starting up some new things. And so again, we'll base that on what are the community needs and. Um, all of that to gather that information and then start applying our, our, uh, our research in the best, best possible way. And, um, you know, it's obviously still a large airspace. It is the safest airspace uh, because of all the hard lessons learned and the safety, um, you know, rigor that's gone into it. But uh, when UASs have to integrate into this airspace, you know, the key thing is we cannot affect this efficiency and it definitely cannot affect the safety. So just to keep that in mind, um, if they put this, it should work. based on data that NASA Ames has collected um, at this point. So, so you can see our airspace. If you look at the time, it's about starting at 2 a.m. There's already about 900 flights. Um, the flights you're seeing right here are primarily the early morning traffic like Memphis, you'll see. And these are our carriers for like UPS, FedEx. Uh, you'll see the country starts waking up on the eastern seaboard. Uh, you see around you know, 6 a.m. now, you can see that uh, you know, it's starting to grow, right? You can see the number of flights down here, about 2,500 growing. Uh, here it is, about 8 a.m., and you can see now all the flights are making their way uh, to the west. There's some international flights coming in, Hawaii and to Asia. Uh, you can see also flights now at, at around some mid-morning uh, headed off toward Europe as well. You can see this migration happening over to the, the western uh, coast, as you can uh, uh, see the traffic build up. And you can obviously see the sea the house, right, the major Hubs that where the um, airlines exist. So let that play for a little bit. You can just see how uh, here we are at 3 p.m. And you'll see another interesting thing that around peak travel times, you see what they say, like you've got about 5,800 flights, or, yeah, about 6,000 flights already in the air um, that's going on throughout the day. Here we are about 7 p.m. Eastern time. And one interesting thing you'll see is look at all these airplanes and these lanes headed towards Europe. And that's typically about the time that those airplanes in the eastern seaboard are on their way to, uh, you know, to, to the European countries. So there's a lot of traffic out there. It's the safest airspace, and it's safe because of all the technology and the, the safety uh, rigor, the regulations. Um, and we're trying to develop these standards <coughs> to get UASs into it. I just want to show you a brief, click of, uh, brief clip of what happens when uh, weather. This is off the eastern seaboard around Newark Airport. So it's Liberty International. Uh, right around there, you see Newark. And if you can just bear with me, I had to fast for just a little bit. But uh, you'll see that the storm itself starts moving. These are all the flow of traffic going through Iowa, you know, in Pennsylvania, getting into the, uh, the, the, the tri borough area of New York, Kennedy. 
Uh, again, just a lot of good flow for right now, but as the weather starts developing, you'll see that, especially particularly the cell that's about to head and start developing over the New York area, New York International there, uh, how that impacts the flow of traffic. And these circles you're seeing are now are the orbits, the holding patterns that are now happening because you got all this weather right over uh, delaying the arrivals on the runways and weather like that. So you can see the impacts and air traffic controllers have to work with the pilots to deviate and make all this work and keep us on schedule. Right? And you can see now this other cell coming over the other western end of Pennsylvania there. You'll see how the flights are now trying to divert around it. So it's almost like, you know, it's actually a barrier that to get around. Some of the flights will see stress their way through. But uh, weather like this uh, does have a significant impact. And so UAS is ultimately going to have to contend with this as well, um, you know, when we get into the, the follow-up integration. And you can see more of it. Uh, First, I was wondering, is there we could fast forward just a little bit? Uh, you have got, like, there's a time about midway, maybe. I just want to show um, a little clip, maybe about there, I think. Oh, can you just use the time? Could you maybe about three? In the back just a little bit. So I just want to show you uh, if you've seen it uh, a little bit more. Back, please. Go about three. So until you see September 11th. So I just want to show you um, the impacts. Again, this is, uh, as you can imagine, so one of our darkest days in history. But around 8 a.m., the Eastern Seaboard was waking up, like in the previous picture that you've seen. So obviously with the first strike of the towers and then the, the ensuing chaos, it is just amazing the airspace system shut down in three hours. So all those, like there was like, I think 5,000 airplanes in the air, um, all had to land and all the European traffic had to divert. So let me show you one, one other view of the national airspace system. Um, it's, it's obviously a profile view of the altitude. So you can see as the day goes on, um, the various altitudes we're talking about. So this is what we call Class A. Laura showed a picture of that. This is the positive control airspace above 18,000, flight level 180. So a lot of it is you have to be properly equipped. You're under ATC control. But you can see it about this time. Look at all these uh, FedEx airplanes now. So it's, it's obviously not the scale. They're not doing ballistic. You know, <laughs> zoom. You know, uh, your packages won't be in. Good shape after that, but, but they're, they're moving up there, and you can see that there are all these flights are just now, you know, they even sorted by airlines. You can see as the day goes on how these flights are coming from their hubs and they're getting into the uh, airspace and getting back to the destinations. But there's also a lot of traffic in this Class E airspace that, that uh, as Lori had mentioned, we have to contend with. So the guys up here are all usually properly well equipped, they're controlled by radar, positively separated, and are not as you know, a, a daunting barrier uh, for the project to, uh, to tackle. But when you talk about traffic down here, some of them could be like the mom and pop Cessnas that are flying in, um, you know, control their space is regulated, but they don't have the, uh, they don't, they're not legal, uh, they're not bound to have some equipment, uh, they only have to be able to still detect that. You know, so, okay, I think it's not that one. Let's show this. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about, can you go one more? This should be, oops, there we go. Thank you. So let's talk about uh, what is detect and avoid. So um, as Laurie had mentioned, detect and avoid is the UAS terminology for seeing avoid. As you can see in the Federal Aviation Regulations here, you have to ultimately be able to uh, maintain both clear. See and avoid each other. Uh, that is the, you know, the, the Federal Aviation Regulations. So the other ways of compliance for an unmanned aircraft that where the pilot is not on board, it does not have eyes out, and it's on the ground, is to be able to provide him with sensors, uh, some other things that provide that scene of void. So hence we call that sensing the void or detecting a void. But the time, the national airspace system that I just showed you is really controlled by air traffic control by certain uh, regimes. And then that migrates toward what we call self-separation, where then you are in this uh, in-between area that we call interoperability time frame between what ATC can do for you and then what you yourself have to be able to uh, sense, look out the window, and then they take the appropriate measures. So we are developing technologies right in this area here uh, that give the UAS pilot the ability to sense proximate traffic, traffic, 
um, determined from the algorithms, the automations uh, help them with uh, determining what may be confidence, and then making uh, very effective and time if, you know, uh, critical decisions to, to maneuver and, and ground traffic. And again, like we said, our main purpose is not to disturb that flow of traffic you just saw, but otherwise, you know, we'll be kicked out of their space, right? We need to flow in there. Um, I know people have used the word seamlessly a lot, but we want to be able to make routine operations of a manned aircraft. So the big A in the UIS is an aircraft that want to be treated like another aircraft. And then Q9, and then we've also used our uh, medium size uh, T-34. Uh, we've also used our King Airs, um, and then we also have a uh, for, a, for a mid size or large to mid size aircraft. And then we also have our G3 that we haven't flight tested against it yet, but it's on our, our remaining flight test schedule to, to replicate more of the airliner type and the higher speed counters. And then we also have this guy here that I showed, which is more of the non cooperative type, about a 55 foot length span, I believe. And um, again, that's going to be a, a low, low performing, low speed, low radar cross section to tax the radar systems. Which button should I hit? Okay, it's not working. Oh, right, probably the circle. Okay. okay, quickly about our airspace. Uh, this is where we are right here. So, this is uh, Edwards Air Force Base right here, and then uh, NASA, we're right here in the upper portion of the lake bed, right about there. But uh, this is a restricted airspace. What affords us this, this ability to test in this unique airspace is that we have a restricted airspace. It's by no means uh, um, separate, I mean, it's no means exclusive usage, so we're not the only ones out there flying. We have to fight our way with all the other Air Force Flight Test Center traffic that's in there. But our operations team has been doing a great job working with Sport, who's the radar controller in this area, to, to get out the two blocks and work it through. But I think if, if, you, if you do your research, uh, I think there's been no other organization out there that's been doing the type of air to air type encounter, especially with unmanned air vehicles. as. Uh, as NASA and our partners have been doing here in this airspace. Um, so what you're seeing there, some of the telemetry you're watching is airspeed within the altitude. We're coming over the lake beds right now. Uh, the airspeed, uh, typically in the high 90s, low 100s, um, it, it flies very nicely at that speed. Um, the landing roll, that's a 12,000 foot runway. It's going to be more than, uh, much less than half the runway. Uh, as a pilot, I'm watching the video, obviously, all this telemetry is kind of in my box, but I'm trying to make the, uh, the picture and all the numbers kind of sync up. I'm looking at torque on the upper right there. You can see uh, uh, about 4%, 5% on the right there. And you can see when we get lower to ground, we'll have some numbers flashing in the middle there. that will tell us uh, the radar altimeter, about 100 feet, tell us 50 feet, and we'll count down to a touchdown. Looking for a nice, smooth touchdown. Obviously. We're uh, seamlessly operating here. It's a very busy airfield. There's a lot of aircraft in the uh, traffic pattern. Most of the times you got heavy aircraft, fighter, uh, all kinds of aero club activity happening. We've got uh, lots of other UAVs flying out here. So you can see there we're 100 feet. It's coming up to the uh, middle there on the left. There's uh, a little box popping up, so we're about 50 feet. 20 feet. You can see the reflection on the airplane there. 12 feet, 10 feet. And then it's a nice smooth touchdown. That's the goal. <laughs> okay, so thanks. Yeah, it is, it's, uh... Okay, thanks, Sam. I'm going to ask you to stay up here, Sam and Lori. Get us back up on stage. And if I could introduce Deborah Randall, our UAS and the NAS chief. Systems engineer. She'll also come up and uh, help field any questions you folks may have. Uh, we've got time for until about. Uh, make sure we're a little long there. Let's maybe try and do about 10 minutes till 10 after 10 till of Q and A's, and then we'll walk out to the hangar and actually first look at the F-18, and then we will go look at the uh, Econa aircraft and then blow the hawk, which is uh, I'm sorry, it was uh, yeah, Lori and Sam, you can join us too.
It's all composite. Um, when we pull it up the fuel, we got about 24 hours of endurance. Uh, typical speeds are about uh, 100, 100 to 150. Uh, it weighs about 10,500 pounds when she's fully loaded. Um, we've got triple redundant avionics. You see three PO tubes, two on the left wing and one on the right. So it's a very uh, smart airplane. Um, it's got a Honeywell TP331 engine. It gives us about 900 horsepower. It's a commonly used engine on a, a commuter aircraft, very robust, very reliable. Um, we talked about the speeds. Our altitudes are about 25 to 45,000 feet. So if someone asked me how we fly around in the national airspace, we pretty much do testing out here in restricted airspace, but we'll file IFR just like any other airplane and fly to where our mission requires us to go. I was going to talk about communicating with the airplane, and this kind of addresses, there was a question about the ability to hack this airplane. Yeah, so uh, kind of basic terms is our ground control station, our cockpit, is in a trailer a few hundred yards that way. So it has to have a certain software load, and it has to match the software load in the airplane. So we're talking two software loads. Any hacker would have to have those two software loads, or at least a compatible software load. And then there's four frequencies used to communicate with the airplane, two uplinks and two downlinks, for be honest. So you have to have access to those frequency bands. Also, you have to have an antenna system, communication system. So under the, the uh, you know, that bulge in the top of the airplane is a dish for satellite communication. And for local area flying, there are antennas uh, underneath the airplane on the top. So there's a, a uh, on the antenna and a directional antenna, top and bottom. And those are C-band. Uh, so the C-band for local area flying, Within a certain range of up here, and those antennas are out near the runway, and they're connected by a fiber optic cable to our ground station. So once the airplane goes beyond that line of sight signal, we switch to a satellite. So a hacker would have to have know which satellite in, in the geosynchronous orbit and have a dish pretty big in order to communicate through that satellite and know which transponder. But it is satellite. possible. So I'm, I'm not saying it's not <laughs> what, possible. What I'm hearing is it is possible. Very unlikely. Yeah, I'm saying it's very unlikely because there's so many barriers to that. And then encryption on top of that would add further uh, variance. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll open up to some general questions. Uh, one of our other pilots showed up, Scott Howe. He also flies the airplane with us currently. So I think. Uh, uh, so we're going to have all the pilots at the table over here. If you guys want to form a line, they're going to be signing uh, photos, autographs for anyone who wants them. And I can answer our general questions too if you guys got some. Table. So if you guys want to form a line, these are the Aikahana pilots signing pictures for social media people invited from all over the United States. NASA sent them an invitation. They got a huge number of responses and invited a certain group that are avid to come and take part in today's festivities. These are some of the uh, places where the pilots work out of. Now we're going into a hangar.
south of Hawaii, and they headed north and up through Oregon, Washington, Alaska. They got all the precipitation you've ever heard of. Well, that's supposed to turn into a lot of heat this year, which means that it's slightly warmer going on in the Atlantic. It makes it turn that gets churned up the Atlantic storms. So, we've been uh, asked to go get rid of the state of those storms. We're going to operate out of Wallops in Virginia, you know. Wallops might be even if you guys are from the East Coast. It's another NASA facility that has a uh, good friend of mine somewhere there. And we have a control room there as well where we operate very similar to what we have here. Fly an airplane across country, land it there, and investigate storms out in the Atlantic as far east as just off the coast of Africa. So that's another aspect. This airplane has very long legs. Well, uh, this badge is usually for 24 to 26 hours in reach of light. And so it goes out and controls around where we have to go uh, do its work. Now it's a little different than some of the airplanes that are doing these nodes. They don't have a pilot on the ground flying it. Figures all that out for itself, so it's autonomous, it's a little odd. And so we go to the flight plan and off it goes. Now, what we can do from our control room is we can change that flight plan routing so we can, if the storm moves, they always move. We can reset up those uh, waypoints and have the airplane fly a different set of patterns over the storm. Um, so we can change its position, but otherwise, the airplane takes care of itself. Once you say take off and fly, they'll taxi out to the runway. Give it the takeoff command, it'll run down the road and go. And you put your hand in your pocket and wait 24 to 26 hours. It'll do whatever uh, flight path you've been programmed into it. Come back, shoot the landing, and taxi to the end So it's kind of different from other airplanes. Um, UAS and the NASA is really important to us because it's hard to get these airplanes up for flight. Right now, a pilot airplane, say like you charter an airplane or you fly a private aircraft, you can say it's quarter to three right now. I want to go fly at 3.30. You can go in and on your computer, you can file a flight plan, and within the next 45 minutes, get out to your airplane and be gone. Well, I still file flight plans with these airplanes, but before I file a flight plan, I have to have a certificate of authorization on file with the FAA that says, I'm going to fly this airplane in these given areas and use these methods to make sure that it's flying the plane safely. And once the FAA buys off on that, then I can fly the plane and go fly it. A lot of that effort takes three months ahead of time. So if you say, Frank, why don't you go fly over to Canada? Frank, we'll be there in three months. <laughs> so it's a little harder. So
white. So it's kind of like a precursor to, to, a, to a tornado, for instance. It can sense like the atmosphere change, the high pressure, low pressure. Yeah, you know, it's kind of on, those, on those lines, uh, there's a lot of computer models that say NOAA, NASA. Yeah, I can see like NOAA's on the generation. Well, they're never perfect. NOAA's trying to make yeah. them better. So a lot of this data we can actually use to examine Okay, yeah. They're finding those computer models. Yeah. Okay. And you kind of see over the years, it's gotten better. Some of you old enough to remember, say, two or four years ago, if someone gave you a three-day forecast, just kind of laugh at them. Yeah, it's like, yeah, pretty much spot on, aren't they? Yeah, it's because the radar and stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. So, that kind of thing, we're just trying to get better at it. Yeah.